Every once in a while, if we are fortunate, we may come across a situation or an individual who may be the catalyst of profound change in our lives. Professor Kehusro Din Shah Irani, who is the embodiment of wisdom, is one such individual, not just for me, but for many others too, as it will become apparent throughout this program. At various stages of my life, Professor Irani has happened to cross my path and most of the time unknowingly has guided me to set the course of the next few years to come. In May 1998, I had the opportunity and the privilege of interviewing Professor Irani for four days. In creating this program, we had to face the monumental challenge of deciding which parts to include and which to cut out. In the first part of this program, we will get the opportunity to know the professor as a person. Professor, thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very happy to be here. There's one story that I've heard which I'd like you to actually narrate here, if you would. Um, and that was the story of the first job offer that you received here in the United States and uh, uh, how you received a pay raise before even <laughs> starting that job. <laughs> well, actually, um, I had been doing some research work and I, my interest moved into philosophy of science. And I was uh, hoping to get some position teaching that subject. And such a position opened up at uh, the City College of New York, and a friend of mine uh, talked to the to Professor Wiener, the late Professor Wiener. Now he passed away about three or four years ago. And I went to see him, and he said that he would give me a job, but. Uh, I hadn't had any experience uh, teaching philosophy. I had been, when I was in India, I was a teaching fellow in physical chemistry, but uh, that had nothing to do with this. And so he asked me if I could get some recommendations. And I had attended some seminars at Columbia and I had uh, those instructors write recommendations. And I was in Princeton at that time. And I had met Professor Einstein on several occasions, two or three occasions. And as I was leaving and coming to New York, I met him and I wished him goodbye. And he said, what are you going to be doing? And I said, well, uh, there is a possibility of a job in uh, teaching philosophy of science. And he knew my interest in the subject. We had talked about it, at least on one occasion, some detail. And I said, but I don't have uh, adequate uh, recommendations. And so he pulled up a pad and uh, wrote down uh, that he knew me and that he knew that I was interested in the subject. And he thought that I would make a good teacher and signed Albert Einstein, tore the page and gave it to me. And more or less instantly, I went to the station, took the train and uh, came to New York and went to see uh, Professor Wiener. And I said, I have this recommendation uh, from Albert Einstein. He said, really? From Albert Einstein? I said, yes, there it is. <laughs> and he looked at it and he said, well, good. Uh, you start two weeks from now. And the opening salary at that time for uh, an adjunct lecturer was uh, $4.25 an hour. And he said, now that you have a recommendation from Einstein, I'll raise your salary to four seventy-five an hour. I had a 50 cent raise. <laughs> and that was worthwhile. I wanted, I didn't have much time, but I wanted to go back to uh, Princeton and thank Einstein for it, but I never had the opportunity. And that was the last meeting I had with him. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people who would be very intrigued to know uh, what was Einstein like, and you've, you're one of the 
rarities nowadays who has actually had the opportunity to meet Professor Einstein firsthand. Could you tell us a little bit oh, about Oh, there were many people who knew him um, and talked with him. Uh, people who really worked with him on a more or less regular basis. I, I didn't. I had just about three or four conversations with him. He was a very insightful person. From conversations he had with others, he attempted to grasp the central point that they were making and then address that. He had an ability to simplify things enormously. But if the other person couldn't see his point, he would try and make an effort to make it clear. And if the person didn't see it then, then he just dropped the whole thing. And I can understand that. He, he didn't have much time around. But we had a conversation. There, there's a book, uh, there are, there's a series of books known as the Library of Living Philosophers. And in those books, uh, there were various people, philosophers, who would write on the philosophy of one particular philosopher. And Einstein was one of them. And there were many people who wrote papers on his thoughts. One of them was Hans Reichenbach, a philosopher of science, originally from Germany. But then he was... Um, here he used to teach at UCLA, but he spent a year in New York teaching at City College and at Columbia. He had written a paper. That book was not out, by the way. And uh, Reichenbach had shown me the paper, and I had uh, studied it with care. All these papers had gone to Einstein for Einstein to study them and respond to them as he wished. And what I wanted to know very much was if Einstein agreed with what Reichenbach thought were his motivations in constructing the uh, general theory of relativity and offering the notion of curved space-time as an explanation. Um, and I asked him that question, and he said, oh, that's a very interesting question. And we discussed it back and forth. And after about 20 minutes or 25 minutes, uh, I said, do you think that Reichenbach has expressed the idea you had in mind? And he didn't answer that question. He said, well, let's talk about it. We were at the Institute and uh, he was about to leave, and so we walked back from the Institute to his home on Mercer Street. And as we were walking, I made one or two attempts to find out if he agreed or not, but he just refused to do so. And then when we reached his door, he said, well, he knew that he hadn't answered my question. And I, of course, had no way of asking him, well, please answer my question. <laughs> But he smiled and he said, well, these are very complex matters. Why don't you go home and think about it and sleep on it? And at that point, we left. But there was, a, there was an intellectual appreciation he had for the kinds of problems other people had in mind. He saw that. And he rarely answered the question directly, but always provided insights which would help you to get a better understanding of the situation. He was an extremely pleasant person to talk to. On that occasion, did he provide you with enough insights or did you actually manage to ponder upon that question and come up with any? I did get the insight that uh, for him, this was a matter of extreme ambivalence. That although he didn't want to reject Reichenbach, he wasn't prepared to go along with him fully. And when Einstein's remarks, when he wrote his remarks, and finally they were published, and I read them two years later, I found exactly that in the writing. He says he's not prepared to answer the question, but he constructs a dialogue between Reichenbach, the positivist, and Poincaré. And the dialogue 
doesn't resolve the issue, but it points up how difficult it is to take a definitive stand the matter. Reichenbach was a very dogmatic thinker. He took definitive stands on just about everything. And I learned a great deal from Reichenbach, but I learned from Einstein that there are issues where you can't just take a particular philosophical, ideological position. How did he treat those who opposed him? I mean, there's the famous saying of Professor Einstein that says, God does not play dice. Uh, and, uh, well, the, the, I mean, in the quantum field, there is this tremendous debate. What this tremendous debate he had with Niels Bohr. They both respected each other naturally. They were both very eminent physicists. And they had divergent positions. And from time to time, Einstein constructed uh, thought experiments which created grave difficulties for the position that uh, Bohr held. And uh, Bohr would think up ways of resolving that matter, enabling him to maintain his position. And this went on and then um, we all, I mean we all meaning the, the five or six people who were very, very much attached to the direction of Einstein's argument. And I understand you were one of those. I was one, but I was an unimportant individual in that field. Uh, we thought that uh, Einstein's position was tenable, that perhaps in future quantum theory might change and something along what he wanted. What he wanted was this, that a scientific theory enables us to explain phenomena. And it explains phenomena by predicting in an experimental situation what the outcome will be. We perform the experiment, we make the observations. In quantum mechanics, one single observation does not count really. We have a series of observations and the statistical distribution of these observations is what the theory predicts, the celebrated Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger himself, by the way, was very unhappy about the equation that he had constructed. <laughs> I had occasion to talk to him and he said the, this function which came to be known as the Schrodinger function is not a representation of reality. It's a metaphor for, uh, for enabling us to make some kind of prediction. And I agreed with him. What Einstein wanted was that the equation of a theory shouldn't just predict. Of course it should predict, but not just predict. It should also give a description of the process in nature. Now the equation is such that such a thing is impossible. And we have grounds for believing that if you do that, you get an inconsistency. And this was the celebrated von Neumann theorem. But there were several of us who believed that the theory will change and so on. And then after Einstein passed away, and I think even after Bohr passed away, Bell developed a particular consequence which is not mathematically too difficult to derive but really it was an amazing contribution and insight and it's known as Bell's theorem which actually makes a distinction between the kind of prediction that would be made if Einstein's position was right and the kind of prediction that would arise if uh, the traditional position which Bohr supported was right. And a set of very delicate experiments were performed in the late 70, 79, 80, 81, some at, uh, in California at Berkeley, I believe, and uh, a very famous experiment in Paris by Alain Aspect. And now that shows us that the Einstein position is untenable. 
And so the philosophic demand that a scientific theory which explains phenomena should also describe what is going on in the world is now unattainable. And I remember reading this experiment and seeing that something to which I have been committed all my life and to which Einstein was committed is now out of the question. That was a like a dagger in my heart. But one lives with it. Nature, some nature doesn't play dice with the will. But Einstein also once said that nature is complicated, but it is not perverse. But now it looks to me that nature is extremely tricky. Tell us about his personal uh, context and attitude. And was he a personable, approachable person? Yes, but not very easily. Um, I don't think he, I think he had this feeling that he didn't have much time. And he was uh, very preoccupied in the attempt to construct a unified field theory and that was uh, taking a great deal of his time. And I think he did have discussions with uh, uh, scientists who, and mathematicians who were in that area. But I think he didn't want to spend too much time on anything else. But he was always pleasant. I mean, I was a very young student, a relative nobody, and I had some ideas. Uh, in that area and I happened to meet him and I I had conversation with uh, Professor Bose before I came to the United States in Calcutta who had had contact with Einstein and their theory known as the Einstein-Bose statistics had been published years ago and I told uh, Bose that I was going to the United States and so on. And that's, if you meet Einstein, give him my uh, good wishes and compliments and so on. And I happened to be at a place at the Institute of Advanced Study. And uh, so I went up to Einstein. I gave him the compliments of Bose and uh, he was happy and he asked me, what ideas, uh, what I was interested in, and I told him a few things. And I mentioned Eddington, who was one of the most important proponents of the theory of relativity. And uh, I was very taken up with Eddington. And Einstein said, yes, in this area that you talk about, Eddington made a contribution. I said, what about the other one? And he said, no, I don't think he was right. Um, and that somehow broke the ice between us and from time to time when I would see him he would wish me good morning, good afternoon and so on and ask me if I had read some more of Eddington and I would tell him yes and uh, this or that. But um, one day I visited him at his home on these occasions, either he had his slippers on with no socks, or he had his socks on with no slippers. Um, and he said that you are from India, what do you think of the political situation there? And I was a little taken aback. Now this was in the 19... This was in 1940, late 47, early 48. So I, no, don't just remember. Just around the independence time. That's right. Okay. Uh, independence had been achieved. I later found that he had read a great deal of Gandhi's writings. And he was very impressed with it. And he asked me how the people in India were able to accept such extraordinary restraint uh, that they would resist a government with uh, 
uh, nonviolence. And we talked about it. He was very impressed with it. And uh, he asked me questions about passages in Gandhi's lectures and so on, which I didn't know about. I had attended one meeting in Bombay, which was addressed by Gandhi. It was a vast crowd, and I was uh, there one among the crowd. And he was an impressive man. Uh, there had been riots, of uh, religious riots, of Hindus and Muslims. And he made it a point to open his remarks with a reading from the Bhagavad Gita, which is a, a holy work of the Hindus, and from the Quran. And his view was that if you are a good Hindu, and if you are a good Muslim, there is no reason to attack each other. It is only when the religion fails to be a religion and becomes, as he said, a flag-waving activity that we get into this conflict. But this was something other than his own non-violence, which was an interesting thing. I, I was surprised that uh, Einstein would spend more than half an hour discussing Gandhi with me. I was more or less entirely incompetent to discuss Gandhi and thought, but he had this interest. And I think he was somewhat bothered by the violence that occurred uh, at the time of the establishment of Israel. He was that way, he was a very peaceful person. He had no... Uh, even when he told you that you are entirely wrong, he did it in such a pleasant way. And he did that to me once, and I said, is this, is this? And I said, no, you are entirely wrong. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I walked by, and as I was walking home, it suddenly struck me, yes, that's right, I was. <laughs> uh, it was such a pleasant uh, way of doing it. Did you ever tell him he was entirely wrong? <laughs> oh, no, no. Or partially I wouldn't wrong? Have, I wouldn't have thought of that. I wouldn't have thought of that. I was in awe of... Uh, I also understand that he was a, an accomplished musician. He was a violinist. Yes. And he was a good violinist, uh, except that as... Uh, who was it? A famous musician once said that he had no vibrato on the violin. And so his violin playing sounded, as he said, skeech, skeech, skeech. <laughs> I don't know, I never heard him uh, play the violin, but he was quite fond of it. Mm -hmm. I had seen the violin case yes. in his study, but that's about all that. <laughs> <laughs> was, he, was he a jovial personality? Yes, he was a pleasant, there was a kind of a mild uh, a sense of... Um, um, irony uh -huh. in things which uh, amused him. Mm -hmm. And I think that somehow influenced me and I began to talk that way. There is a colleague of mine who thinks that my worldview is almost completely dominated by irony. I don't think it's that much, but I see strange things in academic life and I express them. And people thought that, well, I was a bit sarcastic, but I was not. It's the irony of the situation that somehow came to the fore. Yes. But he had that, yes. Yes. Let's talk uh -huh. about your uh, academic track, I guess, has taken quite a... So random <laughs> that <laughs> you started no with point. physics, no is that correct? No, I majored in chemistry. In chemistry, okay. And then where did you go then from there? I really have no clear insight into this. And then I had fellowship in physical chemistry. Okay. And then uh, I became interested in physics more or less on my own. And I did attend some 
uh, lectures and so on and uh, the person who really shifted my attention to philosophy of science was Sir Arthur Eddington. I think I read some of his books over and over again and was completely absorbed by it. His view was that our it's essentially Kantian, that we have structures in our mental makeup which create or which influence the creation of concepts into which the experienced world fits. And so the laws of nature which we have partly reflect what's in nature and partly reflect the relations of the concepts which we have imposed upon nature. How really do we detect this difference? It's extremely subtle, but it is there. He has this story. This, the one story that has influenced my thinking more than anything else. It's the story of the ichthyologist, the person who studies um, marine creatures. So he casts a net into the waters and pulls out a fishy assortment and he studies them and puts down his findings in the journal. He puts down two laws. One, all marine creatures have gills. Two, all marine creatures are more than two inches long. And uh, somebody passing behind him looks at these things and says, doesn't seem, the first law seems like a real law, but the second law is not really a law of nature. And the theologist says, why not? And he says, well, look at your net. The meshes are two inches wide. Anything smaller <laughs> than that pass through. And the ichthyologist says, I am a man of science. I generalize upon the data of observation. This is the collection I made, and I write the generalization. You are talking about some reality beyond experience. You are a metaphysician. Go away. <laughs> now, no scientist would do anything like this. It is not the physical fishnet which is critical, it's the mental fishnet. The structure of concepts into which experience must be molded. And this changed my thinking. And I've been looking at that and uh, more and more this actually this idea comes from Kant. Eddington was a master at presenting these things. Uh, but, and he actually thought that there were certain laws of physics which were of this kind. That purely by examining the concepts, nature of concepts, you could come to this conclusion. Einstein rejected this view completely. Although Einstein was very strongly influenced by Kant, I was surprised that he knew the philosophy of Kant really quite well. Well, anyway, this is really what lived with me. And today I have reached the point that so much of our full structure of beliefs with which we live in the world are dominated by very fundamental internal directives which demand that the world be understood in this way. And that each of these has produced a discipline, that we have constructed methodologies, and that we have uh, produced the knowledge, belief structure we have produced. And I think that's reflected in my scattered, staggered educational career. I like this, I like that, I like that. 
I have an interest in what it is that the human enterprise leads to. And this, when one asks such a question, one is likely to be a philosopher. Let's go back to your career track, this interesting <laughs> zigzag. Uh, between philosophy and chemistry and physics, you took a few years of excursion into law. Tell us about that. What led you to that? Uh, those were the war years and I was engaged in some research and the the instruments and the things we wanted could not be had from Great Britain because of the war and so on and so I was a fellow at the college and I took care of my uh, teaching and then I wasn't doing much and I had the opportunity my father had been uh, a partner in a law firm he had passed away by this time and the partners said that uh, if I wished to study law they would um, have me there and so I studied law. I, I had an interest. Uh, my interest was how is, how is the structure of law organizing social existence? But the courses did not answer that question. These were practical lawyers who were teaching people to go and practice law, except the principal of the college, one um, Asaf uh, Faizi, a scholar of uh, Islamic law and uh, a very fine person. When I applied for admission, he said, what do you want to study law for? And I couldn't give him a good answer and he said, well, I, I wouldn't recommend it and so on. And I said a few things, he said, all right, try it for one term and then see. And so I did. He, he in, got me interested in a few things. Um, and he led me to understand why a certain legal provisions appeared at certain times in history. And we did this with respect to Islamic law. Given the conditions of society, the general principles in the Quran were applied in this particular way. The great creation, intellectual creation in Islam is Islamic law. And that led me to think about our legal system and so on. And particularly that our moral norms, the norms we find which parents teach us when we grow up, are all bound to social context. But often we are taught as if this is what you do, you do not ask questions and you live in this particular way. And I was never satisfied with this. And then gradually I began to apply this to value theory, that we have certain ultimate eternal values and we apply them at different times in different societies to handle the kinds of problems which arise. And this was, I think, very valuable in my study of law. But then I passed my examination and started to work in a lawyer's office. And I realized that I was not uh, cut out to be a lawyer. Largely because one has to take interest in minor affairs of people 
did not deliver this this time and he didn't do that and these people separated and this item must go here and that item make a list and change the list and so on and I just totally lost interest I had no reflection on this I suddenly found myself uninterested and so I sort of walked away and that led you to more physics. That's right. And then I went to physics and then into philosophy of science. And now, then uh, since I st uh, started teaching philosophy of science in the department of philosophy, I uh, began to be interested in other parts of uh, philosophy. And I was very much interested in philosophy of mind. And that was not a course which was being taught at City College. And I asked the chairman, I, and he said, well, let's see, you, you think people would be interested? And I, think, I said, I think so. And then we had to square that with the psychology department that we don't poach on their grounds. Well, the chairman of the psychology department was, had taught philosophy earlier. And we had a long talk and he wanted to know what I was doing. So, we arranged to have a course in philosophy of mind and he attended some of the lectures. And uh, he was very comfortable and so philosophy of mind became an established subject at City College. And I taught it, oh, I think for about 15, 17 years. And uh, I did quite a bit of work in that area, I still do. I have some of my colleagues in the psychology department we jointly teach a course. And then it turned out, by the way, I'd studied quite a few uh, philosophers and so on at Columbia University. And there was a UNESCO seminar in ancient cultures and religions, which was arranged under the auspices of UNESCO. The chairman of that was Dr. Moses Jung, a, a Jewish scholar, a very nice man. And they had representatives of different religions and they couldn't find a Zoroastrian, so they asked me, so here there were these bishops and these, the, the uh, head of the seminary, Jewish theological seminary, a Greek Orthodox bishop and so on, and me, <laughs> the solitary Zoroastrian who they managed, they didn't know any other Zoroastrian, so I was there. I enjoyed it. Um, and the small book came out of the series of those uh, lectures and then one of the professors of religion at Columbia, a philosopher, uh, Professor Horace Fries, um, asked me to give some lectures to the, to the group of students in courses in religion. I did on Zoroastrianism but this led me to read up the history of Zoroastrianism. And through that I became interested in ancient thought. These people, by ancient thought I mean essentially, um, say, before the period of Alexander. And I was very surprised that very profoundly thinking human beings argued in strange ways, came to very different conclusions. And so I began asking myself, what is the nature of thought that moves in this way? So these strange things came out of different aspects of my life. And I have done a great deal of work on ancient thought. Now, in the last few years, I have developed an idea of a kind of a history of ideas of what happened to the human spirit 
starting from perhaps uh, very early existence as cavemen and coming to this post-enlightenment period. And that is, I think, perhaps my true original contribution in philosophy. Let me take you back to the law firm. Uh, while you were losing your interest in law, practicing law, you were beginning to gain interest in something else there. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you are getting at. <laughs> Would you tell us about it? Well, my wife at that time, the person who was to become my future wife, was also working in that law firm. And uh, we came in contact with each other. There were um, cases we worked on together. And I found something very interesting that she had an extraordinarily rapid intuition into uh, legal uh, um, resolutions or the ultimate legal ends. I had to look up references here and there, how would this be interpreted and so on. And on several occasions I found that uh, what the conclusion I came to after days of work, she had come to in five minutes. And I began to realize that perhaps uh, I'm a little dull in the area. And also that she is very bright. The strange thing was that she couldn't really give me the exact line of argument by which she came to that conclusion. but. And so we talked and we exchanged our ideas and uh, she was about the only person who was interested in these other things which I had in mind. I really don't know how much she was really interested in, but she was ready to listen to me. And she listened to me at some considerable length. And then we mutually respected each other and loved each other and finally we married each other and you've been married together um now it's been 35 years no no 45 years 45 years i missed 10. <laughs> um, and it has been really a a true sharing of life which has made an enormous difference to me. It has been enormously supportive. And uh, a considerable amount of inner peace, tranquility and happiness has come to me through that. From the very little contact that I've had with her, I've come to realize that she's a very quiet person. Yes. I think that is, uh, that is accurate. Unless she is aroused <laughs> then the lawyer comes <laughs> out. <laughs> there, there have been times once she was uh, tricked and cheated by somebody in the law firm. And when she was sure of that, she gave that person a, an unbelievable dressing down. Mm -hmm. So that happens, but that's not part of her personality. Have you been? Ever the recipient well, there have of been <laughs> occasions when she has um, deservedly repudiated me, but always very kindly. Um, always very kindly, but sometimes very firmly, yes. What is the secret of living with someone for 45 years and still being in love? Uh, well, we are. Um, I think it has been that very deep sharing of uh, our lives and uh, the fact that uh, she knows what I am aspiring to or what I want and she gives me unstinting support even without my asking for anything. She does that and I realize it and so there is this 
bond which I really cannot express in ordinary words, but it is a very uh, deep one. And then we personally, each one of us, regards the other with very deep affection. This is love and uh, it is utterly non-demanding. This sharing has, I think that's, that's what it is. I don't know. Professor, one of the most influential people in your life and in your thinking has been your father. Yes. Tell us a little bit about him. Well, he was... Um, his father had come as an infant from Iran and grew up in Bombay, in India. Was uh, an engineer in a textile mill. And he died young, uh, leaving three children. My grandmother, my father's mother, raised them, but under difficult financial circumstances. My father graduated uh, with literature as his subject and then studied law. And when he was studying law and becoming a, uh, an attorney, um, he made a living by teaching uh, Persian, uh, Persian literature, really. And I think uh, maybe some other courses in literature. In his uh, youth, I think when he was a student in college, he attended the lectures of the very celebrated Parsi scholar K.R. Kama, in whose name there is a well-known institute for uh, uh, ancient uh, Indo-Iranian studies in Bombay. And there he studied the Avestan language, and then the particular ancient Avestan, the Gothic language. And he had this interest in the Gathas. And this was completely aside from his professional interest? His which profession was, was in law. And uh, he became uh, very proficient in law. His specialty was uh, taxation and taxation of corporations and so on. But he also practiced law generally, was frequently appointed uh, an arbitrator in family matters and so on, where he did not want conflict and what he wanted was a resolution in peaceful ways and so on. Uh, so that was that part, but uh, he under the influence of his senior partner, who later became um, a member of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in England, uh, who was interested in my father's uh, translations of the Gathas, that was uh, Din Shamullah, who asked my father to translate them and publish them. So my father translated uh, quite a few uh, about almost half the verses of the Gathas, and they were published. And uh, the book was widely read, went into about um, six or seven reprintings. But he hadn't translated the complete Gathas. And he kept on doing it. Uh, his health was uh, rarely good, and that was a big damper. But he more or less completed the translations by the time he passed away, particularly in the last year when he was quite ill. Um, and he uh, discussed that with me almost every evening. What happened was that I would go from my school to his office and wait for him to finish. And then we would both go by car to a suburb where we lived, Bandra. And during this trip, 
we would have discussions. He would uh, say something to me and then ask me to uh, formulate my thoughts. Uh, really from the age of 10 or 11, I had this responsibility to say something intelligent on any number of subjects. But I think my expo exposition to the Gathas came from that period. Now that meant a great deal to my father. I remember him reciting the Gothic verse in the Gathas. And I could feel the poetic effect. But there was more than that. I think uh, when I was two years old, uh, my father had a very, a very serious illness. And uh, the doctors in India said that uh, the kidney required to be removed in a particular way and they were not prepared to perform that operation in India. And there was a specialist in Paris who performed this surgery. So he went with my friend, with his friend, Dr. Gilder, who had been his school friend, and my mother, of course, and they went to Paris where the surgery was performed. But on the way they had said that his chance of survival was about 50-50. I was two years old then. And he felt that he should leave some instructions in case he did not live for me. So he took a book, very nicely, beautifully leather bound with gold emboss and so on, and wrote letters to me. Well, he survived, but I had the book. I still have the book. And I read it, and he had uh, hopes for me. And he said, my hope for you is that you will become a good servant of the community. I've tried to do that. And whenever I'm asked to discuss something, present something, I never say no because I remember this. He also said that I should stand for the principles of righteous behavior, but always remember not to hurt someone. Let no one say that here was someone who hurt me. And that was when I was chairman of my department for nine years, that was hard. <laughs> but uh, I had to maintain the integrity of the department, fair treatment and so on. At the same time, I did my best for the person to feel that this was not something that should cause him hurt. But people were hurt. So these things have molded me very, very deeply. Well, that's the... Other than your father, who was the most influential person in your life? I think my mother. Tell us about her. How did she influence you? My mother was considerably younger than my father and she was widowed early in life. And she lived a long life. She was a very really able woman. Uh, person who did things, very firm personality and character. My father was mild and gentle. My mother was a very powerful person. One day I was discussing at the dinner table my readings in ethics and so on, and I presented the well-known view of utilitarianism, which is that to be moral is to maximize satisfaction and minimize dissatisfaction. And uh, this is how we put it today. In the original, it was maximize pleasure and minimize pain. And uh, my father had passed away at that time. There were my aunts, my mother, my brother. And my mother asked, what is this that you're discussing? I said, this is ethics. 
your general life should be such that you maximize pleasure for yourself and for others and minimize pain. And she said, what has pleasure and pain got to do with ethics? And I, it was a shocking moment for me. Here was a full theory <laughs> and there she saw no connection. And then I realized that she had a different view. She had a Kantian view, which she expressed to me. I mean, she didn't know Kant. <laughs> she said that ethics has to do with duty. And this was her thing. You recognize your duties and you perform them, even under difficult circumstances. She rarely saw exceptions to things. For her, life was hard, but it had to be faced. And one had to face it with confidence and perseverance. This was a strong influence on me. <coughs> and I still remember, almost I remember her voice on various occasions, saying this and saying this and so on. I always felt that it was a little too rigid. She had grown up in a rigid family. This, the, the family came from Zoroastrian priests. Mm -hmm. And she was the youngest of, I think, nine or ten children. They were moderately well off, not really, but uh, and she remembered certain uh, deprivations that she had. For example, she liked eggs. And when she was very small, she asked her mother for an egg for breakfast. And her mother said, we don't have that many eggs. And the eggs are for the boys, not for the girls. And uh, she related this story to my wife when she was 80 years old. And this must have happened to her when she was six or seven. Wow. And she remembered this. And she agreed with her mother that that was the right thing to do. The boys had to go and make a living and therefore they had to be sustained. And they had e eight eggs. But and she agreed at the age of 80, not at the age of six, <laughs> I presume. That's right. That's <laughs> right. right. Yes. This was a cast of mind. I at one time thought that she was, uh, her way of thinking was very Germanic and it fit in with Kant's thinking. <laughs> she may well have been a kind of a Prussian general. She would lay down the law and, say, and she would tell me, this is what I had said and wanted and you failed. And uh, so I didn't know how to handle that situation too well. 